On a sweltering afternoon on August 11, 2023, the typically serene atmosphere of Pensacola, Florida was violently disrupted. A solitary individual, carrying the weight of dark intentions, boldly walked into a crowded Home Depot. With motives as dark as they were mysterious, he initiated a spree of gunfire, plunging the ordinary into chaos within moments. The store, usually a place for finding tools and household necessities, became the scene of a tragic loss as one individual was fatally struck. Their life abruptly ended amidst senseless violence. This heinous act was magnified by the wounding of two others, colleagues of the victim, caught in the assailant's blind rage. As the investigation unraveled, it exposed a tale of deep malice, a stark disregard for life that left even veteran investigators aghast. This case prompts us to explore complex questions about morality, mental health, and the essence of evil. This story delves into more than just a criminal act. It examines the darkest aspects of human nature. On that day, a Home Depot employee in Pensacola bore witness to a harrowing event. Returning from lunch, he recounted, I was settling back at my station, about to grab my iPad for inventory checks, chatting with a colleague, when I heard several shots fired. Instinctively, I yelled for us to take cover and ducked behind the counter, immediately calling 911 while hiding. I stayed on the call, reported the shooting, and remained under cover until we were instructed to evacuate by the arriving officers. Upon their arrival, deputies of the Escambia County Sheriff's Office found a young woman, 18-year-old Sophia, a single mother with a two-year-old daughter, lifeless in aisle 52, where she had been working her shift. Two of Sims's co-workers also suffered injuries from the gunfire. One was superficially wounded on the head and the other on the back. Witnesses informed deputies that the shooter had fled the scene. It appears the victim was specifically targeted, shared Escambia County Sheriff Bernard, noting that the others injured were simply caught in the line of fire. Surveillance footage revealed a man entering the store and heading to aisle 52, where the incident unfolded. Moments later, as people fled the area in panic, the suspect was seen escaping towards the entrance, then speeding away from the parking lot in a silver sedan. This detailed recounting provides a clearer picture of the tragic events and their profound impact on the community, emphasizing the urgency of addressing such violent acts and the importance of safety and solidarity in the aftermath. Shortly after the tragic incident, a call was made to the Pensacola Police Department from a man at a Mellow Mushroom restaurant on Bayou Boulevard. Yes, 9 to 1 1. Hi, I'm trying to turn myself in. You're where? I'm trying to turn myself in. Okay, where are you at? I'm at Pensacola, indistinct. Pensacola, Alabama? I don't know what street I turned on indistinct. What are you trying to turn yourself in for, sir? What are you trying to turn yourself in for? I made a mistake. I shot someone. No, you're fine. Just calm down. We'll get someone to help you. Are you injured at all? After providing his location, officers swiftly arrived. The caller was identified as 20-year-old Jane from Calvert, Alabama. He was apprehended without any issues, as noted in the arrest documentation. Transported to the Escambia County Sheriff's Office, A.G. underwent questioning, during which, after waiving his rights, he divulged to detectives the turbulent history between him and the victim, Sophia. Their on and off relationship spanned four years, producing one child. Agui recounted how, despite a protective order Sims had against him, they still interacted, primarily for him to see their child. He mentioned a recent weekend spent together at his place, which was peaceful and included intimacy. The motive he suggested for his drastic action started with his day at a steel company in Mount Vernon, Alabama. A call from a medical office informed him he had tested positive for gonorrhea, which incited his anger. Leaving work, he went home for his 9mm handgun, then drove towards Pensacola, aiming to confront Sims at her job. He recalled pausing in Luxley, Alabama, contemplating his next steps. Pride, however, clouded his judgment, 
leading him to continue to Pensacola. Upon reaching Home Depot, his attempt to speak with Sims was rebuffed. Feeling mocked by her and a co-worker's laughter, he reacted by firing multiple rounds, fatally wounding Sims and injuring two others. Luna admitted to fleeing the scene in his car after the shooting, marking a somber conclusion to the day's events. After discarding his firearm out of the car window, a move later pieced together by law enforcement when they recovered the weapon, Luna found himself aimlessly wandering. He made his way to a movie theater's parking lot, where he drifted into the woods and trudged through a creek. In these moments of isolation, he made the decision to call 911 and surrender himself to the authorities. Following his confession and subsequent arrest, Jane was booked into the Escambia County Jail. He faced severe charges, first-degree murder with a domestic violence specification and two counts of aggravated battery using a deadly weapon. Pending his initial court appearance, Luna was held without bond. This pretrial detention, while a procedural step toward justice, merely marked the beginning of a more complex and shocking narrative. The investigation took a dramatic turn with the examination of Luna's cell phone, obtained and searched under a warrant. The initial findings from this forensic analysis were astonishing, revealing an exchange of text messages between Jane and his mother, Sheila, that painted a dark prelude to the day's tragic events. These messages spanned from early in the morning on the day of the murder, continuing up until the moments leading to the violent encounter at Home Depot. The communication revealed a chilling plot. Merely minutes after learning of his STD diagnosis, Luna was informed that his mother was at the same workplace as Sims and was planning to give her a ride back to Alabama later that day. Fueled by anger and resentment, Keith disclosed his intentions to confront and harm Sims. The text messages between him and his mother were stark, showing a disturbing level of planning and lack of remorse. Keith expressed a misguided justification for his plans, citing financial burdens and the STD as provocations. His mother's responses were equally troubling. Rather than dissuading him, she appeared to engage in the planning, offering practical advice on how to avoid legal consequences and logistical details on executing the plan without endangering herself. Their conversation went as far as to strategize about the location and manner of the attack, with Keith indicating a willingness to act regardless of whether their daughter was present. These messages not only exposed the premeditation behind the attack, but also highlighted a deeply troubling dynamic between mother and son. The forensic examination of Luna's phone, therefore, opened a new chapter in the investigation, revealing not just the act of violence itself, but the sinister deliberations that preceded it. The text message exchange between Jane and his mother, Sheila, not only outlines a premeditated plan to murder Sophia, but also exposes a disturbing complicity and a blatant disregard for the consequences of their actions. Despite brief moments where Sheila seems to reflect on the gravity of their scheme, her involvement and encouragement of her son's violent intentions are clear. The conversation's progression from planning to execution, coupled with their efforts to cover their tracks, underscores the malicious intent behind Sims's murder. In court, the gravity of Luna's involvement as an accessory to the premeditated murder of Sophia is laid bare. Represented by public defender Harold, Sheila faces the legal reality of her actions, actions facilitated by her encouragement and assistance in her son's heinous plan. The charge against her, principal to premeditated first-degree murder, carries the weight of her contribution to the crime, highlighting the legal system's recognition of her significant role. The state attorney, underscoring the severity of the offense and the compelling evidence against Sheila, argues against the granting of bail. The nature of the crime, crossing state lines from Alabama to Florida and culminating in a tragic loss of life, underscores its heinousness. The mandatory life sentence looming over Sheila, should she be convicted, reflects the seriousness with which the legal system views her actions. This case reveals the complexities of legal and moral responsibility in crimes involving multiple actors. Luma's involvement, as depicted through the chilling text exchanges with her son, 
showcases a profound moral failure and a stark violation of legal norms. As the proceedings move forward, the focus on Sheila's role and the potential consequences she faces underline the broader implications of aiding and abetting in criminal activities, especially those as grave as premeditated murder. The refusal of bond for Luna by the judge, despite the defense's plea for a $250,000 bond with conditions, underscores the court's perception of the severity of her involvement in the premeditated murder of Sofia. The defense's argument Emphasizing the reliance on text messages potentially taken out of context and Sheila's lack of criminal history was not sufficient to sway the court's decision. The decision to keep Luna without bond reflects the court's concern for public safety and the nature of the crime. The involvement of Luna in the planning and coordination of the murder, as stated by Sheriff Bernard, adds a layer of shock and disbelief to an already tragic case. Her extradition from Alabama to Florida and the subsequent charge of principal to first-degree premeditated murder highlight the legal mechanisms at work to address her alleged participation. Under Florida law, the charge recognizes her as an accomplice, underscoring the legal principle that one does not need to be physically present at the scene of the crime to bear responsibility for its commission. This principle of holding accomplices responsible is pivotal in addressing the collaborative nature of certain crimes. It ensures that all individuals who contribute to the planning and execution of a crime are held accountable for their actions, regardless of their physical presence during the act itself. Luna's separate trial from her son emphasizes the legal system's commitment to individually assessing each participant's role and culpability in a crime. The denial of bond, the extradition process, and the charges brought against Luna demonstrate the seriousness with which the legal system treats the involvement of accomplices in criminal acts. As the case proceeds, the focus on her specific contributions to the crime will be critical in determining her legal fate. Her next court date, set for February 28, 2024, will be another step in the unfolding legal process that seeks to address the tragic and shocking murder of Sophia. The case of the state of Florida against Jane began on December 19, 2023, with prosecutors stepping into the courtroom, confident in their robust case against Luna. The evidence they presented was compelling, including a confession, undeniable video proof, accounts from several witnesses, and incriminating text messages. This wealth of evidence suggested the trial might merely be procedural. On August 11, 2023, Jane set out with a grim purpose. The prosecution aimed to demonstrate that Luna's objective was to locate and fatally shoot Brooklyn Sims. The court would learn of Luna's journey from his workplace in Alabama to Pensacola, specifically to a Home Depot. There, he methodically approached the aisle where Sims was stationed and fired no fewer than seven shots from a 9mm handgun, successfully carrying out his grim task. Facing this daunting array of evidence, Luna's defense attorney was tasked with the challenging job of countering the strong case presented by the prosecution. The defense opened by expressing gratitude to the jury for their patience and attention, emphasizing the importance of their role in delivering a just verdict. Despite acknowledging the unlikely challenge of disputing the facts and evidence presented by the prosecution, the defense pivoted to focus on the nature of the act. They conceded the act but questioned the context, suggesting the jury consider whether Luna's actions constituted premeditated first-degree murder or whether there were mitigating circumstances that could lead to a lesser charge. The defense highlighted the importance of assessing Luna's mental state at the time of the crime suggesting that extreme emotional disturbance might have impaired his capacity to premeditate the act, potentially arguing for a conviction on a less severe charge than first-degree murder. This approach aimed to shift the jury's focus from the act itself to the psychological state behind it, opening the door to a discussion about the complexities of human behavior and the legal implications of intent and premeditation. In the trial of Florida v. Jane, which commenced on December 19, 2023, Luna took the stand, a move often seen as risky in murder trials. He was sworn in, 
beginning his testimony by describing a day that started ordinarily but took a turn upon receiving a diagnosis of gonorrhea. Luna's testimony aimed to humanize him, delve into his mental state at the crime's time, and demonstrate remorse. Luna recounted the sequence of events leading up to the tragic incident, emphasizing the shock and betrayal he felt upon learning of his STD diagnosis, which he attributed to Brooklyn Sims. This emotional turmoil, he suggested, clouded his judgment and led to the fateful decision to confront Sims at her workplace. During cross-examination, the prosecution scrutinized Luna's actions and timeline, focusing on his travels from Alabama to the crime scene, his interactions with his mother, and his immediate response to the medical news. The questioning highlighted discrepancies and sought to undermine Luna's portrayal of his mental state and intentions. Luna admitted to driving directly to Sim's location upon receiving her address from his mother, contradicting any notion of premeditation denial. Despite claiming emotional distress, his calculated actions, tracking down Sims, preparing a weapon, and executing the attack, painted a picture of someone acting with a clear, albeit disturbed, intent. The defense's strategy hinged on presenting Luna's actions as the result of a momentary lapse in judgment caused by emotional distress, aiming for a lesser charge than first-degree murder. This nuanced approach required the jury to consider not just the act itself, but the complex interplay of emotions, intentions, and responsibility. In the case's conclusion, the focus shifts dramatically towards the emotional and legal climax of the trial. The prosecution, led by Jasper, makes a compelling closing argument, urging the jury to see the murder of Brooklyn Sims by Jane as both premeditated and driven by more than just a moment of rage or betrayal. Jensen argues convincingly that the murder was an act of pride, suggesting that while the STD might have been the catalyst, it was Luna's ego and anger that led to the tragic outcome. The defense's attempt to mitigate Luna's actions through the narrative of a heat-of-the-moment crime fails against the prosecution's narrative, which paints a picture of deliberate, if not cold, premeditation. The emotional testimony, the evidence presented, and the closing arguments all lead to Luna's conviction for first-degree murder, underscoring the irreversibility of his actions compared to the treatability of the STD that ostensibly prompted them. The revelation 